Good afternoon. I'm happy to see so many of you here today as we welcome our new provost. And I appreciate that we have been set up in such a way that uh, Dr. Mukasa and I can take our masks off and remain socially distanced and um, you'll be able to hear us better. I don't know about any of you, but I, I have said, what? I can't hear you. Can you say that again? About uh, 10,000 times in the last 18 months. So I hope you'll be able to hear us. Um, I am really honored to welcome our new executive vice president and provost, Dr. Samuel Mukasa. And then when we finish our uh, conversation, you maybe have seen that we have refreshments in the back and I hope you'll all stay and join us for a welcome reception and have an opportunity to interact with Sam afterwards. I have a, uh, an introduction and then a few questions, but uh, Dr. Mukasa has made it clear to me that he would like to hear from all of you. So we'll leave time for you to ask questions yourselves, um, hoping that this is more of a conversation and less uh, of a presentation. So I can start out by telling you, for those of you who haven't yet heard, uh, Dr. Mukasa came to ESF after a distinguished leadership career at the University of Michigan, the University of New Hampshire, and the University of Minnesota. He most recently was the lead in the provost's office at Minnesota for global academic and research initiatives in STEM, focusing particularly on the global South and Asia. As dean there, Dr. Mukasa was chief executive officer and chief Chief Academic Officer for the College of Science and Engineering, the university's second largest college. Dr. Mukasa previously served as Dean for the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences and the Eric Asin Professor of Geochemistry at New Hampshire. Prior to UNH, Dr. Mukasa spent 21 years on the faculty at Michigan, where he was chair of the Department of Geological Sciences, which is now the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Dr. Mukasa holds a PhD in geochemistry from the University of California, Santa Barbara, a master's in geology from Ohio State University, and a bachelor's, no, yes, a bachelor's geology <laughs> from UNH. I did it in reverse order. Uh, Dr. Mukasa completed a postdoc research fellowship at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University in New York and earned a leadership in higher ed certificate from the Institute for Management and Leadership in Education at Harvard University. Um, I um, would like to just tell you some of the outside of uh, his day job leadership positions he's had, which include chairing the advisory committee for the Office of Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation, and serving as a member of advisory boards at the National Academy of Sciences, focused on plate tectonics, scientific ocean drilling, and climate change considerations, among many other scientific and professional leadership roles. Dr. Mukasa is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Geological Society of America. Very impressive resume, and we are thrilled and honored that you are here. And I will start out with a very easy question, I hope. Um, this was an easy one for me to answer when I came here and as president about a year ago. But we'd like to hear from you. What drew you to ESF? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Johnny. I, I hope this is going to be the last time you read uh, oh, that, that introduction. I'm getting embarrassed by it. Um, those are things I did in the past. I don't want to hear about them. So let's talk about the future. Um, you know, what drew me here? Uh, a whole number of things, but um, I, I promised I was going to keep my answers nice and short because I would like to... Um, reserve a significant amount of time toward the end of the hour to hear from you so that we can have some discussion. Um, but um, um, I think it's appropriate for me to say that ESF is one of those places that has um, you know, a wonderful sense of purpose. It has a direction. It's focusing on issues that are going to dominate the conversation uh, not only nationally, but globally, uh, for the next several decades. Many of those 
research topics that uh, um, a number of institutions are beginning to embrace, uh, where are the key issues that this uh, particular institution was founded on? So we hit the ground running years and years ago, and I've been telling people, let's not fall asleep because somebody else is going to come and uh, eat our lunch. Uh, so we've been at this at ESF for a very, very long time, and this is one of the things that I found very attractive in coming here. I started out my career focusing on geohazards, looking at volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, you know, those sorts of things, but increasingly became attracted to climate change considerations because I was using uh, geochemical methods to look at geologic records, you know, sediments that have been deposited by glaciers, which are no longer there, you know, that sort of thing, and therefore recognized what you do, what you've done over the last several decades at ESF to be the sort of place I'd like to be. Um, I probably should also add, but don't tell my colleagues in Michigan or Minnesota that uh, after being on campuses with 51,000 students, I love it here. Thank you very much. Um, I know there's a lot of faculty, we have students in the audience, there's a lot of faculty here that will be particularly interested in how you define your role here as our new provost. You know, I am learning on the job. I have been a dean for over 10 years at two very, very different institutions. But if you ask me what a provost uh, does, I would say that uh, uh, he or she is the individual who has the obligation to build trust through hard work, uh, through transparency, and essentially serve as, uh, I, I would say, an enabler, as a person who cheerleads. I'm going to be a cheerleader of all of the teaching and research activities that, that are going on. So it's a job that um, I think is very much um, uh, looking toward the students, looking toward faculty achievements, uh, but also uh, being very mindful of the fact that besides solving the problems we are facing uh, today, that one thinks strategically to realize that there are going to be a, a few curveballs thrown our way going forward, so that being a strategic thinker and anticipating what's coming from around the corner that's still on the horizon somewhere is also going to be part of the job. So to me, access, you know, being um, approachable, being transparent, explaining why reasons have been, uh, the reasons why decisions have been made a particular way, uh, those are the key aspects of uh, what a successful provost is going to look like. Um, one other thing I should add is, is that in the conversations I've had with a few of you uh, since my uh, interview process got underway, um, I realized that um, uh, some members of the faculty or even the students uh, have felt a little disconnected from um, uh, how decisions are made. Um, people say that communications could be better. And by the way, I should add, I've heard this in just about every institution where I have worked. Uh, so um, one way of addressing that in my previous positions uh, was to um, make sure that I had a way of communicating with uh, the faculty, the students, and the staff in what I call town hall meetings. I, um, um, in my previous gigs, I would make the rounds between all the buildings we had in my college. At UNH, we had five buildings. So every five months, I would repeat the cycle. I would go and sit in a conference room and, and, and uh, show up and tell people I don't have an agenda. I'm here to listen to what you have to say, answer any questions that you might have. And, and then we would sit there and simply have a conversation. And um, I have told some of you that uh, um, after running a few of these and realizing that the faculty dominated the conversation, uh, I decided to insert for every three of those town halls I held for faculty, I inserted one exclusively for staff. 
because otherwise the staff would attend these things and never really have the opportunity uh, to say very much uh, in the hour that we had. And then as far as students are concerned, most of my interactions with students have been um, really through clubs, uh, Society of Women Engineers, uh, National Society of Black Engineers, Society of Professional Hispanic Engineers, uh, and so on. I've dealt with um, much of the you know, public engagement and uh, outreach to K-12 by really partnering with students, and many of the ideas we followed uh, have been nucleated in those uh, uh, interactions I've had with uh, student groups. Uh, you had mentioned that during the um, search process, that concept of those town halls, and I have repeated that, and it sounds like people are looking forward to that opportunity with no agenda to just, at random intervals, uh, talk about what's on their mind. So you're saying I am committed now. You are committed. Okay. <laughs> All right. I love it. Um, I also, well, before I uh, ask the next question, I just want to say that there's a lot of seats up front, and we're very casual, so please join us if you're interested in um, taking a seat. Uh, Dr. Beyer, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, so, Sam, what are, what are some of the initial priorities? As you said, there's going to be things that around the corner. We're going to get some curveballs. We don't know what tomorrow is, but it's our job to anticipate that. But as you sit here today, what are some of the priorities you have as provost here? You know, Johnny, I have to say that uh, whatever your priorities are, are my priorities. Oh, Sam, <laughs> I thought that was just a search process answer. <laughs> No, you know, it's, it's funny, that question uh, showed up multiple times uh, during my interview process, and um, um, I pointed out to my colleagues that I was talking, I was speaking with at the time that, uh, you know, if I show up with a prepackaged set of uh, priorities that I've developed before ever stepping on the campus, and I show up and I tell you this is my list of six things that we're going to do, I would advise you guys to run the other way. Uh, I was uh, really making the point that what the priorities to emerge, um, you know, should be, uh, you, you know, really should be based on an exchange of ideas, uh, having dialogue between the provost and uh, departments and divisions and students, faculty, staff, over the next few weeks. But this is not to say that I showed up with a completely clean slate. I've been watching higher education for many, many decades. Um, I won't tell you how many. Um, but I've been watching this landscape for many, many years. So I have observed a few things that are common across all institutions. So for example, given what we've gone through over the last 18, 19 months or so, with, with the COVID pandemic, uh, wellness has become extremely important. It's uh, something to be concerned about on the student side. It is something to be concerned about with the faculty who have had to do amazing things. So you are to be applauded for uh, the transitions you've gone through to keep the academy uh, going. And, and, all those and also the staff. The staff have done a wonderful thing over the last almost two years now, uh, keeping things going, sometimes working remotely, sometimes braving the elements to come into campus and so on. So wellness is one of those things. Um, the second thing that you keep hearing about in the news all the time is access and affordability of higher education. We attract a lot of students to the university, uh, to universities, campuses. We are not able to provide support to all of them, financial support. And as a result, uh, we now have, um, you know, recent graduates of universities having a debt of $1.7 trillion. You know, no wonder nobody's buying houses. No wonder no one is getting married. No one is starting families. You, you know, uh, I'm exaggerating slightly, but uh, that's the trend. This is why demographics are headed in the wrong direction going forward. Uh, we are saddling 
people who are graduating from college recently with a tremendous amount of debt. So I want to address that. Uh, it turns out that um, in my previous appointments, I've done a significant amount of fundraising, and I realize that the provost position may be a little bit different, but uh, Johnny and I have been talking about this. So as time permits, um, I would like to give it a go to make sure that we address access and affordability uh, as one of those things that, that, that the provost does. And then I would also say that um, uh, another priority is, 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 is obviously faculty excellence. And I'll tell you that when I went to, um, uh, from the University of Michigan after 21 years there, uh, to my alma mater, the University of New Hampshire, um, you know, this was 11 years ago, um, the provost told me uh, that uh, UNH was very much a bimodal institution. You had a lot of young faculty just getting their careers started, um, you know, having the challenges of uh, time management, having to teach more or less the same amount as faculty who had been there 30 years, uh, and yet having a much bigger uh, research uh, enterprise getting underway. Those are likely to be issues here as well. So when I start visiting departments in another week or two, um, I'm going to be very interested in the feedback I receive from all of the faculty on how you think we might deal with uh, issues of that kind. We want to build a very strong faculty that does a wonderful job of balancing research and teaching, and uh, the answers to the questions might vary from department to department, and this is why I'm interested in visiting all of you, not just one or two, getting some idea and running with that idea, I want to hear the full spectrum of uh, how each one of the departments might, uh, um, you know, try to engage with those with those questions. So my priorities are really student focused, faculty focused, uh, resources. We are going to need resources to get some of these things done, and um, uh, the rest of it is whatever the boss says I should do. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, so. I'm, I think um, folks here in the audience will be interested. So you, you earned your undergraduate degree from UNH. Um, how about previous to that? What, where in the world that was home for Dr. Sam Mukasa? Um, well, Dr. Sam Mukasa is a transient, uh, if, if you want to put it that way. Um, I, was, um, I was born in, in Kenya, but I'm not a Kenyan, although I should probably go back and uh, claim my citizenship there. Um, I grew up in Kenya and Uganda. I was in Uganda for 11 years. That's where my parents uh, came from. So at the age of um, 17, 18, <clears throat> I left Uganda and went to the UK. Uh, to finish uh, A-levels, and then from there came to the U.S. and went to UNH. And the reason I ended up at UNH, many people always ask me, of all places, why did you end up in Durham, New Hampshire? Well, it turns out that um, when I was growing up in, in Uganda at the age of about 15, 16, I met uh, um, a very nice kid from Hudson, New Hampshire. Uh, Brian is still one of my best friends today. Uh, we hit it off and became very good friends. We used to go swimming together, used to play squash together, we used to cycle together. So we became very, very good friends. And when I was looking for a place to go to university, uh, Brian's family, which was then back in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was my host family, and that's how I ended up at UNH. So the UNH connection, believe it or not, uh, started in the swimming pool and uh, squash courts back in Kampala, Uganda. <laughs> that is very interesting. I was curious how you pick New Hampshire off the map. Um, so how about your love of, your passion, uh, enough passion to earn your PhD there? Like how, how did you become interested in nature and in um, particularly the changes that you could see over time, and you know, where did that come from? 
Yeah, you know, it's um, another interesting story because when I was in third grade, um, one of my very, you know, revered uh, maternal uncles gave me a pencil sharpener that, that uh, you know, had a hole where I would insert my pencils. People know what pencils are? <laughs> Show of hands. Uh, I, 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 well, some of you are you know, old enough to know what pencils are, but you know, these days you never know when you're talking to students, uh, they, they don't use pencils. Uh, anyway, so this pencil sharpener uh, had a globe uh, for the receptacle of, of uh, the shavings from, from the pencil. And uh, the globe had, uh, you know, the, the continents. And as my uncle handed me this thing, he said, have you ever noticed that uh, uh, Africa and South America can fit back together like jigsaw, pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. I was eight years old and I said, wow, nobody ever told me that. How did this happen? Y you know, so it, it was uh, readily apparent to me that these pieces fit together and to an eight-year-old I figured they must have been together at some stage. Believe it or not, that little encounter which lasted only about 30 seconds is the reason I'm here. It, it, it uh, launched me on a career to understand plate tectonics and uh, it launched me on a career to really appreciate time. You know, I started thinking about time and ended up actually getting a PhD measuring time um, using radioactivity, uh, specifically focusing on the uranium uh, radioactive atoms of uranium decaying to, to lead, and eventually I worked with other systems, but I've used them to measure rates of plate tectonic movements, the coming together and the breakup of continents, and um, through making those measurements, uh, built an entire career that has lasted over 30 years now. Uh, so to me, I developed an interest in nature from a pencil sharpener, if you like, <laughs> and then eventually uh, really fell in love with climbing mountains. I've, I've been on top of Kilimanjaro when I was 15. I was 20,000 feet up, and, and I thought next stop was going to be uh, Everest. Um, I'm still waiting. It hasn't happened yet. If I take a break, uh, you will know I've gone up the mountain. <laughs> we will know where to start looking for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, how about um, now in your free time? How do you like to spend your free time now? You know, when I was at uh, UNH, I met uh, a young lady who was very interested in similar things to me. Uh, she was interested in cycling. She was interested in... Uh, playing squash when a lot of people didn't quite know what squash was. Um, so we were uh, 20 years old, and uh, 40 plus years later, we're still together. She's my wife now. Um, so we like outdoorsy things. We own kayaks. We own a canoe. We have uh, mountain bikes and racing bikes. Um, so we do a lot of things um, outside, outdoors, and one of the questions I was asked earlier is what are you going to do in the you know, central New York region? Well, we've always driven through this area because we lived in Michigan and her parents uh, lived in New Hampshire, so we always went by here on uh, I-90 and uh, spent nights um, um, on you know some of these finger lakes, but you know never really had the opportunity to explore them. So this might be our opportunity to finally figure out and find out what the finger lakes are all about. And uh, I've done some field work in the Adirondacks with the University of Michigan students, and I know we have fantastic uh, uh, research facilities there. So I can't wait to jump into the president's fancy car. And, and, and go up to the Adirondacks to look at uh, uh, some of those uh, research facilities we have there. And I'm, I'm listening to you with my hat on as a parent, and I'm thinking swimming lessons and a pencil sharpener, and then they're launched. 
geochemist in Absolutely. their future? Okay. So the, <laughs> the uh, key to all of this, uh, Johnny, is uh, do buy a few pencil sharpeners. <laughs> I'll have to explain to them what a pencil is, and then we'll take it from there. Um, so back to your role as provost, um, as you and I have talked about, and I'm sure this is um, something that is in all of the institutions that, from where you've come, academic excellence and student success are really central to the experience here at ESF. What do you think that me, you, the rest of the administration can be doing to ensure that, you know, to support faculty, staff, and students? Yeah, that's um, really the, whatever, the 60 million dollar question, and, and I do mean 60 million, uh, because, um, you know, first of all, I think I should say that th there isn't really a prescriptive pathway that we can draw up today and, and adhere to for the next five, 10 years uh, and, and not uh, deviate from it. So in other words, uh, I think student success, faculty excellence, all of those are going to be achieved uh, by really remaining vigilant to change, making sure that we stay ahead of the curve and anticipating changes, and there are going to be tremendous uh, numbers of changes, I think, over the next uh, five, 10 years. Uh, a lot of it is already underway. You know, you're seeing, you know, from the trenches where the faculty are, uh, you're seeing changes in pedagogical methods. You're seeing students who learn differently compared to the way that you and I did it when we were students several decades ago. Uh, so really being resilient and, and being nimble to anticipate those changes, I think are going to be key to uh, student success. Uh, simply you know, writing out uh, you know, a pathway that we're going to follow over the next five years, chances are by the end of year one, much of it is going to be obsolete. Now, we're obviously going to be trying to um, you know, attempt to get on those pathways, but uh, we can't be too married to them. Um, we have to realize that uh, uh, course changes are going to be absolutely vital uh, for us to ensure that success that you speak about. So how today, as we sit here with all the disruption that we've had from the pandemic and the student debt that you've talked about and the changes at the rapid pace that they're happening in the world. How do you answer the question for families considering higher education? Um, wh where's the value proposition for families? Yeah, you know, I did speak about the 1.7 trillion. I think this yeah. is dead. Is it, is it back on? Um, so $1.7 trillion debt that uh, recent college graduates have to deal with. Um, you know, that's a huge responsibility to take on as a young person. I was asking Kitty uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, I forget, um, how much the average ESF graduate owes when they graduate. And the answer is about $27,000. Um, which, um, you know, for somebody facing a mortgage of uh, whatever, $200,000, um, it's frightening to leave college with a debt that is so high when you haven't even received your first job. So I understand that. But nevertheless, I would say, you know, speaking to that uh, family that you're talking about, uh, Johnny, um, that besides the economics, and I think they're still favorable even with that debt that we're talking about, uh, I think that um, uh, one of the biggest gifts of a college education <clears throat> is that developing that analytical ability, uh, developing the skills to be critical, developing the skills to base your decisions and actions on data. You know, you don't believe in magic anymore. You want evidence. And you're finding that in the discourse we're having nationwide and, and actually beyond, this is a global discussion today, that there's a tendency for some people not to have the ability to assess 
whether what they are hearing about science, about vaccines, about climate change is true or not. You know, so it becomes a belief system and belief systems are very dangerous when they're not based on uh, verifiable data. So to me, the value proposition of higher education today, uh, economics aside, uh, has to be developing the ability to think critically and analytically. Uh, I think, to me, that's almost a human right. Everybody deserves to have that capability. I haven't heard that question answered like that before, and I intend to copy it and repeat it. I think that is absolutely true, and a lot of the world's ills would be solved um, with that thinking that we earn, really, that we learn here in, in college. Yeah, you know, reading newspapers over the last few weeks, um, it's, it's uh, tragic to realize that uh, uh, the level of education is proportionally or directly correlated to the way we understand the COVID pandemic. So in other words, people have died unnecessarily for lacking that ability to be critical, to be analytical about the data that we are receiving from the FDA, from uh, the CDC, and, and all of this. Um, some people have chosen to look at this problem from a belief system uh, rather than embracing the scientific information that, uh, so in other words, most college graduates, um, a few quarterbacks uh, exempted, uh, believe in science. And, and um, did I say something? <laughs> He's not a Buffalo Bill. Uh, thanks. And I, um, I do have a few more questions, but I know that you made it clear that you wanted to hear from folks. So um, unless people are really shy, um, I'll hold my questions and open things up. Um, somebody has a microphone, is that you, Karen? Uh, does anybody wanna get us started? Danielle has one too over on this side. Does anybody have a question for Dr. Mikasa? I see one in the back. Good afternoon, thank you so much. My name is Sarah Nahar and I'm matriculating here in environmental studies as a PhD student and also at SU in religion. And we're looking at how collaboration can happen between those institutions, which both institutions have said they want it, but what are some of your plans or connections that you're fostering to make sure that these institutions can stay in collaboration? And of course, that ESF gets the respect it deserves while collaborating with SU. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, one of the huge advantages I have um, is that my counterpart at SU has seniority on me of just a few weeks. <laughs> you, you, you know, she was uh, just hired, uh, Gretchen Ritter, I think is her name. I think so. Yeah. October 1st. Yeah, so she just started. Uh, and so she is going to be doing, you know, the sorts of things I'm going to be doing, engaging with people, learning about our inst respective institutions and so on. Uh, one, um, thing I did last night was to actually go into the carrier dome. Um, so that's off my bucket list. Uh, I'll do more things with SU. Um, but to your point, yes, I think uh, being in close proximity with each other the way we are, uh, it's absolutely vital that uh, we come up with, I, I already, you know, I'm aware that there's significant, there's already a significant amount of interaction between the two institutions. Uh, but going forward, I think, you know, there are going to be lots of opportunities for us to uh, grow and augment uh, what, what is already existing. I am, uh, <clears throat> you know, particularly interested in uh, the student experience. Um, and I don't think it needs to be only unidirectional. I think it should be bidirectional. I was just talking about our uh, research centers and the, um, in the Adirondacks that uh, ESF students enjoy, uh, I think we need to you know, create opportunities for SU students to also come and uh, develop that uh, field experience, especially, again, given that uh, uh, the entire globe is uh, focused on 
environmental change, climate change, and so on. So we can do some things with them that uh, em empowers their students to, um, to develop those expertise uh, field exp through field experience. Uh, there'll probably be a number of others. Um, we are all eyeing what the federal government is doing with respect to infrastructure, with respect to um, the social fabric as well, you know, that other bill that they're still debating. Uh, there are probably going to be resources in both of those that are aimed toward um, institutions of higher learning. And uh, uh, I think partnering with uh, big neighbors like SU is only going to you know, benefit us than going it alone. Yeah. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Yep. Because we have people watching us online. So, Provost Mikasa, welcome to the college. It's really great to have you. Thank you. So you were talking about being attracted to ESF because it is well suited to tackle some of the big problems that are facing the world today. We can hit the ground running here. Yep. And as I've been exploring, I mean, I'm doing my postdoc right now, getting this research out in the world, mm -hmm. I'm constantly hearing that getting these disruptive technologies, these, dis these disruptive methodologies out there will require interdisciplinary approaches. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is this something you are considering in your trajectory here to handle these challenges, fostering communication to do this within the college and also without, and outside the college? Uh, yes. So interdisciplinarity is, is something I've championed uh, pretty much uh, ever since I became an administrator. And, uh, you know, you're taking me back on memory lane here, but um, um, I embraced this concept when the president of the University of Michigan uh, about 15 years ago, um, uh, Mary Sue Coleman was her name, um, challenged all of us to think outside our usual little boxes, you know, our departments. And um, she might have even been the person who coined it, the saying that, uh, um, you know, the world has problems and universities have departments. You, you know, meaning that uh, these problems don't necessarily, you know, stop at uh, disciplinary boundaries, but that to solve those problems requires interdisciplinary teams. And, and so I teamed up with uh, other departments at the University of Michigan, and we built a cluster of faculty. We, we started hiring clusters of faculty to address problems rather than hiring individuals. You know, that Dr. Smith is retiring, let's replace her with Dr. Brown. We, we were no longer in that game at all. We wanted to know what the compelling issues of the day are and how many different expertise is it going to take for us to tackle uh, that problem and make some headway on it. So for us, it was, uh, we were looking at uh, climate change 15 years ago, <laughs> stability of uh, ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, and, and water resources. We were looking at all of those and hired a cluster of five faculty distributed between three departments and that group continues to work together to this day. That's one example. The second example is that when I was dean at the University of Minnesota, I, I was in a college with 435 faculty, uh, but they were distributed in departments but I think even better than that, we had some 20 interdisciplinary research centers that brought people together from as many as four or five different departments. So for example, if you wanted to look at uh, biodegradable polymers, um, we had a group of faculty, maybe six or seven of them, uh, from chemistry, from chemical engineering, from material science, and I forget who else, all working together to create these biodegradable polymers. Uh, so to me, uh, interdisciplinarity is part of my DNA. I recognize the benefits of thinking that way as opposed to uh, going it alone. And, and I actually see ESF, because of our small size, 
and, and the fact that uh, we have cross linkages between departments, that I'm simply going to be a cheerleader and a facilitator uh, to ensure that we deepen that interdisciplinarity that uh, you, you seem to be a champion of as well. So we should talk. <laughs> These are some great questions. Any other questions? Claire? Um, hi, Dr. Mukasa. My name is Claire Dunn. I've been helping the communications office out with some writing and editing projects. And I'm curious, as we've been trying to tell our story for all these years, and which benefits all of us students and partnerships and funding sources, do you have any particular thoughts about the best pieces of ESF to highlight which which of our many strings to pull to, to tell the stories that would benefit all of us? You know, Danielle is on it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I remember <laughs> in, uh, <clears throat> when, when I was visiting um, during my interview process, I felt comfortable enough with uh, one group I was meeting with in particular. I forget whether it was department chairs or some other group, and I said, you know, your, your uh, websites are a nightmare. Um, and, and they said, we know. <laughs> so um, I think there are so many low-hanging fruits that we can work on uh, to build a brand and to exhibit it to the degree that it actually deserves. Uh, so to me, um, you know, from what I've seen so far, um, there are a few tweaks we can do almost immediately that are going to uh, really, I think, elevate our game. But a lot of it, you know, is already underway. It started taking place before I ever got here. So I think uh, our leadership um, over the last year or so, you know, has recognized the few things that we need to do to get that started. But, you know, as we do so, um, I think that um, <clears throat> maintaining that visibility is largely going to be built around uh, also always building faculty excellence. You know, you don't ever finish building faculty excellence. If you have it today, uh, don't sign out and say we've done it uh, because others are gaining on you. So this is going to be an ongoing activity of ensuring that we have the, you know, adequate facilities, if not the best facilities, to do that research, and also to not be shy about sharing what it is we've achieved. Um, you know, I'm kind of a website disruptor, if you want to call me that. Um, I went to UNH to be dean and, and immediately was turned off by their website, and I went to Minnesota and was immediately turned off by their website. Um, I wish you could see what uh, those two respective colleges websites looked like when I got there and what they look like today. Um, I wanted them to tell our story. Um, the, actually both the UNH website, uh, website for the college and for the University of Minnesota, the moment you open the page, it said something about what courses to take for um, uh, for this major and that major, and then at the bottom was a button that said donate, and that was it. <laughs> y y you know, um, and I was pointing out that rather than asking me to, if I want to become a chemical engineer or a chemist, you know, click here, uh, I want you to convince me to click on that when I get to the next page. But I want you to pull me in as I open the website for the first time, tell me a wonderful story of something that has happened in the college, discoveries, uh, student opportunities, where are your students? Are they in the outback of Australia or are they in the classroom uh, clicking on these course sequences to get a degree? You, you know, so I wanted stories to be told uh, on that first page and, and I think we can do some of that. And again, as I said, we have a wonderful team here that is already developing those concepts. Thanks, Claire. 
We have about 10 more minutes. Anybody have a question before we get to the refreshments part of our reception? There were those, those wonderful cookies from yesterday. I was hoping they would make uh, <laughs> a return. I didn't see them. <laughs> we were teasing uh, Dr. Abrams yesterday. He was getting a lot of credit for the cookies. Um, so while you're thinking about your next questions, um, I have been given a question to ask you, and I don't know if three matters, but just kind of what are your, what do you think the top global environmental issues are for us right now? Yeah, you know, when, when you look at um, the issues confronting humanity, in a place like central New York, we are blessed with the climate we have. You know, don't worry about the little storm coming next week or whatever. Uh, we have water. We have reasonably predictable uh, weather conditions from day to day. Uh, a majority of the people in the world, especially in the global south, Africa with its 1.3 billion people and Asia with its uh, multiple billion people, uh, many of those people, like for example in the Punjab, uh, rely on agriculture. Subsistence farming is really what they are. Um, and Africans likewise, many of them are subsistence farmers. And the biggest threat to those communities is the unpredictability of future climates. Um, many of those communities have learned over the generations to rely on um, seasons, and in, in this case it's not winter, summer, spring, and fall, it is when is it going to rain for me to spend, you know, the $2 or $3 worth of grain that I have left to plant food for next year or for the next three months. When you no longer can predict when you should put your precious few seeds in the ground, uh, that's a very dangerous thing. And you may think that in central New York where we have lots of water and uh, predictable seasons and so on that we are protected from it, when there is a global disruption that's going to impact several billion people, we are going to hear about it. We are going to hear about it. And it's going to impact us. Uh, so things like, um, you know, what is happening to the global supply chain and, and so on, I think all of those are going to be multiplied tenfold as we go forward. So to me, um, some of the major challenges that we're going to face because of global change, because of climate change, are not readily visible in certain parts of the world, that, but I think they are going to become um, more visible as we go forward. And then, you know, this being New York, we have um, uh, a coastline, uh, we have colleagues, uh, relatives, uh, friends who live in places like Long Island and and uh, Staten Island and Brookline and Manhattan and so on, uh, where uh, sea level rise is also going to be quite, quite a significant factor. Uh, already, uh, for those of you who've been to places like the Carolinas and, and uh, uh, Miami, um, uh, is it Miami Beach? Uh, at high tides, um, when we have a full moon, uh, you see seawater in the streets. That's pretty new and it's going to get worse as, as, as we go forward. So food security for very large parts of the world, for very large populations uh, all over the world, is going to be a serious problem. And then property damage because of sea level rise and so on, uh, I think are also going to be, uh, to be re really um, you know, major challenges. Thank you. Go ahead, yeah, Danielle's coming back. So just to follow up on that, we saw what you were you know, most worried about, but what are you most hopeful for in the coming years? <laughs> That's a very nice question. Yeah, what, what am I most hopeful about? That we are finally going to get our acts together. Uh, I think there are quite a few challenges facing humanity that we've always had solutions for, but never had the will to accomplish. Uh, I think that the crises we are facing are finally going to force us to grow up. And I would include among those uh, issues such as diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
uh, where um, you know this country, for example, is never really going to realize its full potential until we are inclusive of everyone. Um, and I can tell you that I'm coming from <laughs> leading a college that had 5,500 students. Only 1.6% of them were African American. Uh, and yet, in the Twin Cities area uh, in Minnesota, uh, increasingly you're seeing high school graduating class classes with upwards of 20% minority students. Uh, so I've been, you know, preaching in the Twin Cities area that uh, they're very proud of the fact that uh, there are 17 Fortune 500 companies uh, headquartered in, in Minneapolis. Uh, all of those uh, companies, you know, the likes of Target and General Mills and uh, Boston Scientific, you know, all of those are likely to pull up stakes and go where, um, you know, skilled labor is available. If you have a very large population that is cons uh, consisting of minority uh, groups, which are not being included in higher education, um, and, and the majority of people who are attending the university are a diminishing resource. The numbers in the upper Midwest are going down. Numbers of 18-year-olds are finishing college is going down. So the, the workforce, skilled workforce, is going to be becoming smaller and smaller. If you're a target, why would you stick around? Let's go to New York, right? Let's go to where uh, inclusivity has been baked into the cake so that we have all hands on deck. Uh, that is a very, very important aspect of social justice, and I think going forward, um, we are awakening to this. And so I'm very hopeful that we're going to be wearing big boy pants. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um I appreciate very much that your um, willingness to sit and, and do this with me. Um, that wraps our formal part of the conversation and I just wanna thank all of you. I just can't believe my good fortune that I get to spend my days among such smart, good people that are doing such good work and when we do get that collective will globally, uh, a lot of the work that's gonna be done is based on science that's done here at ESF. So it, uh, it is really my honor to be in this role and to be welcoming Dr. Mukasa. Good things ahead. And I will see you all in the back of the room for some refreshments. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here.